If I have one goal today, it's by the end of this, you all will understand what my title means. <laughs> First, to motivate this topic, I'm going to tell you a story. The story is a tale of two batteries. And the two batteries in question are lithium ion batteries and flow batteries. Lithium ion batteries, we all have lithium ion batteries in our pockets right now in our cell phones. We all know what they are. They're a dominant force in a lot of industries today. Flow batteries, I'm curious, how many people know what flow batteries are? Raise your hands. <clears throat> We're a self-selected group of energy nerds, so a number of hands were raised, but a number of hands weren't raised. And actually, when I talk to people in everyday life, pretty much nobody knows what a flow battery is. So that's pretty interesting, but let's go back to the beginning. Lithium ion batteries were invented in the 1970s at Exxon Research Laboratories by MS Whittingham and colleagues. Flow batteries were also invented in the 1970s with a lot of work being done at NASA. So both of these batteries were invented around the same time. And then what happened? Well, flow, lithium ion batteries in the 1980s saw R&D. In the 1990s, Sony introduced the first consumer electronic with lithium ion batteries, the camcorder. This led to a revolution in the consumer electronics. Phones, cameras, laptops, all used lithium ion batteries. And then as time went on, they started increasingly being used in electric vehicles, trans starting to transform that market. And they're also already being used as grid scale energy storage. They're the, the dominant technology for new installations in grid scale storage. And and also into the future. How about flow batteries? Flow batteries in the 1980s saw uh, R&D. In the 1990s, R&D, some niche applications. In the 2000s, R&D and some niche applications. <coughs> and again, some R&D and some niche applications. So a very different trajectory for these two batteries that were both invented around the same time period. Although flow batteries, there is a lot of excitement including in our group, for flow, the use of flow batteries in the future for grid scale energy storage. But before we get to the future applications, I think it's worth reflecting on these two different battery systems invented around the same time with widely different trajectories. So why is that? Now, you can't pin it down to any one reason. But if I had to choose one reason, it would be this. It would be energy density. Lithium ion batteries have about five to 10 times the energy density of flow batteries. <clears throat> That's why they're chosen for portable applications. And all of that use of portable applications increased their market share, it increased the manufacturing cap capability and, and the investment, and it lowered the price. And that led to it increasingly being used in grid scale storage and, and other applications. So flow batteries don't have those same applications. And so they haven't received that same sort of cost reduction and scale up. <clears throat> so why is this and why are we still excited about flow batteries? To learn about that, we have to look at the architecture, the basic architecture of the two batteries. Lithium ion batteries have solid compounds that store the charge and they're connected by a liquid that's ionically conductive. L flow batteries, on the other hand, have liquids that store charge, so the charge molecules are dissolved in these liquids and there's a solid ionically conducting membrane in between them. And the fact that these are liquids means that there's a lot of advantages to flow batteries. You can decouple the power and the energy, which means you can create a long duration battery. You have the possibility for low cost reactants because you, you have a much bigger space to play from. You don't have to always use cobalt, for example. And you could have a very long cycle life because you don't have a solid microstructure that's going to degrade. On the other hand, the solids give you a very high energy density. So a few years ago, our group was thinking, what if we could make a flow battery that could have an energy density near that of lithium ion batteries and somehow get the best of both worlds? The problem is that's actually really, really hard. And to see that, I want to I want to look at two different metrics that are critical to energy density of batteries. The first is the standard reduction potential, and the second is the capacity. So what you want is a standard reduction potential of your two sides to be very far apart. Because that means that there's a very big <coughs> energy difference between your two sides, and there's a, you store a lot of energy for every charge you pass in between the two sides. 
And you want the capacity of both sides to be very high so that you can store a lot of charge in both sides. And lithium ion batteries have both of these. They have a very far apart standard reduction potential, so they have a very high voltage and they have a high capacity, and that's because you're storing these lithium ions in these solids. Uh, the lithium would be green in these crystal structures. So you can fit a lot of lithium ion batteries into these layered compounds. On the other hand, flow batteries and the conventional flow batteries use water as the solvent to dissolve the compounds that store the charge. They're constrained on both of these axes because you can't have the voltage be too far apart with a flow battery because if you go too far in either direction, you either start making hydrogen or making oxygen out of the water. You start water splitting. You also can't have too high of a capacity because you, have, you need all of those water molecules around to create the liquid. So you, for just one charge storing compound, you have all of these water molecules around rather than being able, able to fit a lot of lithium ions into this solid framework. So this suggests that in order to create a high energy density flow battery, we somehow have to get rid of this water, get rid of the solvent. So how could we do that? How could we create a solvent-free flow battery? <clears throat> There's a number of different knobs you can turn to make a solid into a liquid. You can dissolve it in a solvent. You can heat it up, use a high temperature battery. You can modify a compound. Organic chemists can, chemists can take compounds and put asymmetric groups, bulky groups, very long chains that are floppy, and thereby lower the melting points of compounds. And you can also use eutectic mixing, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Eutectic mixing is not new science. It's actually very old science, but it's something that we think is not paid attention to really at all in the context of flow batteries, and we think that it's something that actually might hold some promise. So what is eutectic mixing? What is a eutectic system? It's a system where the mixture of two compounds has a lower melting point than either individual compound. And you can see that in this eutectic phase diagram. So we have temperature here. So these lines show the temperature of phase transitions. And then you have composition on this axis, so go going from pure A to pure B. So the melting point of pure A is here. The melting point of pure B is here. And the melting point of the mixture is lower than either of them, with the lowest point being the eutectic point. So this is called a eutectic phase diagram. The most well-known eutectic is that of water and sodium chloride. And that's why we spread salt onto, onto roads in the winter to reduce the melting point of the ice. So we started working on a eutectic between sodium and potassium. It's, it's literally the combination of pure sodium with a melting point of 98 and pure potassium with a melting point of 64 to see what this looks like. Here's this video. This is a piece of potassium. This is a piece of sodium. Now these are very air and water sensitive, so we do this in an argon-filled glove box. But you can see if you just mix them by, you just mash them together at room temperature, you create a liquid. It's a room temperature liquid metal that's being created, which is actually the stable phase at room temperature in this eutectic phase diagram. So we did some research to demonstrate that you could use this in a flow battery architecture if you used a ceramic membrane and we published that in Juul last year. And we're excited by this because if you'd use NAC, as it's called, sodium potassium, in a flow battery, you would have one side that has a very high capacity and a very low reduction potential. So that would be a good thing for energy density. But we still need something on the other side of the battery. So what would we put there? We were thinking of using quinones, which are organic redox active molecules. They're studied for flow batteries, both aqueous and non-aqueous systems. <clears throat> and they're studied because you can reduce them. You can actually put two electrons for on each molecule, uh, either with uh, alkali metal salt or with a proton to create a hydroquinone. And you can go back and forth. You can store charge this way. Now these compounds are solids at room temperatures with increasing melting points, as you can see. So we had an idea, what if we could mix two of them together and we can create a liquid that had a lower melting point than either one on its own? But the eutectic phase di this phase diagram is not in the literature. We, we couldn't find it at all. So we'd have to make it ourselves. We'd have to study it ourselves. But if, if it did happen to be true that we could do this, then a mixture of benzoquinone derivatives would have a pretty high 
energy density and be up here in this diagram. So it would be great as the other side of a high energy density flow battery. So we studied this with differential scanning calorimetry. Th that gives you peaks whenever you have a phase transition. And you can see these peaks show that we had a melting point that was lower than either of the two on its own, both for the charge and the discharge states, which means that we do have eutectic mixing going on in these compounds, which was exciting. But we also didn't have as much of a melting point decrease as we wanted. We're still, you know, still around 100 degrees C for these compounds. So we still wanted to, re to lower the melting point even further. So how could we do that? Actually, using eutectic mixing, if you, if you start adding in more compounds and increasing the number of components in your system, you increase the entropic driving force to, to make the liquid. And so you can conceivably lower this melting point even further. But the problem with that is as you add more components, you now increase the phase space dramatically. So let's say you wanted to know the exact eutectic composition in this phase diagram by measuring every 3%. So you'd have to make 33 measurements. But let's say we had seven different compounds that we were mixing together, and we wanted to know the exact composition of the eutectic every, by a 3% error. We'd have to mix roughly a million compounds. So that's not going to happen. We need some model that could help us predict what that composition would be. So we use machine learning. No, actually, we used a thermodynamic model. <laughs> this is actually really sim a simple thermodynamic model that we applied here. I'm not going to go over it, but it's a regular solution model assuming immiscible solids. And thermodynamics, everyone should study. I, I heartily approve. <coughs> And the way we apply th this is we took seven different compounds with melting points between 44 and 120 degrees Celsius. And then we made every binary mixture of them and measured the eutectic melting point from the DSC. And we plugged that into the model to get an interaction parameter in the model. And then we can plug that back into the model to get a prediction for an n-component mixture. <clears throat> and to see how that looked in the end, if we took a mixture of seven, all seven of these quinones, the model prediction is that the eutectic composition would be this, this different proportions, and the melting point would be minus 2 degrees Celsius, which would re represent a 70 degrees Celsius decrease in melting point from the weighted average melting points. <clears throat> when, you, when we measured the equimolar, so an equal proportion of each in the differential scanning calorimetry, we did see a peak at around minus 4 degrees Celsius. So that shows that the eutectic phase is there at about the temperature we predicted. But we saw a lot of other peaks, which meant that we still had a bunch of solids in the system, that we, this equimolar composition wasn't the eutectic point exactly. But when we went to the predicted composition, we actually saw mainly one peak. There's a bit of a shoulder, so it's not exactly the eutectic composition yet, but it is a lot closer. And that's exciting because both it sh demonstrates that we can decrease the melting point dramatically by going to a higher number of components, going down to minus 4 degrees C here, and also that we can get pretty close to predicting what that composition will be just by this simple thermodynamic model with the number of measurements that we made. <clears throat> and, that, and then eventually, we might be able to use this in batteries. So to summarize, flow batteries have many advantages. But their big disadvantage is their low energy density. And that's because of all the solvent molecules that you have floating around that you don't want to react and that take up weight and space. And so what we've been working on is using eutectic mixing as another knob to engineer liquids that are solvent free. So you just have the pure charge carrying liquids, uh, molecules as liquids by lowering the melting points via eutectic mixing. So I want to give a few acknowledgments. As I, as I do that, I'm going to show you a video of the quinones being mixed. So these are three different quinone powders that have a eutectic point that's a little bit lower than room temperature. I want to acknowledge Professor William Chu. He's the PI of all of this research uh, in the material science and engineering department at Stanford. A number of people who have contributed to this research in various forms, uh, formerly and presently. ExxonMobil is our current funding source, which I want to acknowledge, and also our previous funding sources. And you can see this liquid being formed. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Antonio. We'll we'll uh, have questions at the end, I think. Okay. All right. So our next speaker is Aisulu Aitbekova. Aisulu did her undergraduate in a degree in uh, Kazakhstan, received her master's degree from MIT, and now she's a third-year PhD student in chemical engineering. Her research is with the uh, Carnello Group, Matteo Carnello, and focuses on the design, synthesis, and application of novel materials for catalytic applications. And so today, uh, she'll be talking on nanoparticle-based catalysts for CO2 hydrogenation to hydrocarbons. I see. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'd like to tell you about my research uh, on nanoparticle-based catalysts for CO2 reduction to hydrocarbons. As you all know, CO2 emissions have been increasing since the Industrial Revolution. And in 2017, more than 40 gigatons of CO2 were emitted. One way to reduce the net CO2 emissions would be to react it with renewable hydrogen to produce high-value products such as fuels and chemicals. This reaction at atmospheric pressure mainly yields two products, methane through the methanation pathway and carbon monoxide through the reverse water gas shift. And among these two products, uh, CO is more valuable because it can be used as a feedstock for other processes. My previous work uh, on CO2 reduction uh, was done at atmospheric pressure using ruthenium nanoparticles supported on Syria. And when we performed this reaction, the major product is methane with selectivity of more than 95%. And we can see, you can see it from the chart on the right uh, because CO and methane were the only uh, products formed. What we found is that by uh, oxidizing these nanoparticles at very low temperatures, lower than 200 degrees Celsius, uh, we can redisperse nanoparticles into highly dispersed species. And these species no longer make methane. Instead, if we perform CO2 reduction over this single site, we make CO with selectivity of more than 90%. So what we found is that by simply changing catalyst pretreatment, we can change structure of our materials and thus uh, get different catalytic activity. <coughs> but as I mentioned, we are, not, uh, we are interested in making products beyond methane and CO. We want to make hydrocarbons. Uh, I just want to tell you that CO2 hydrogenation to hydrocarbons is usually referred to as modified Fischer-Tropsch synthesis. Fischer-Tropsch synthesis is a process which converts carbon monoxide and hydrogen into hydrocarbons. And this is a well-established pro process that has been studied very extensively. And iron is uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the catalysts that is used for this reaction. What is interesting is that when CO2 is substituted, is used as a feedstock, iron can also make hydrocarbons due to its water gas shift properties. Iron also has cheap price, which makes it appealing for this reaction. So it's not surprising that people have been interested in studying iron for this reaction. There has always been interest in how we can uh, improve activity of iron-based materials by addition of various dopants. And specific attention has been paid to ruthenium, because ruthenium is one of the most active fischer metals. Its addition to iron is expected to increase conversion of catalyst. And by alloying iron with ruthenium, uh, one can potentially induce different electronic properties, which would result in different product uh, selectivity. So if we check the literature uh, and uh, try to understand whether ruthenium uh, promotion effect has been studied before, we can find studies that showing indeed by adding ruthenium to iron, one gets higher activity and different product selectivity. We can also find studies showing that addition of ruthenium doesn't change activity or selectivity. <laughs> and if we try to understand why people come up with different results, uh, one potential reason is how these materials are made. Traditionally, such materials made uh, through conventional methods, which, uh, which can result in different structures of materials. For instance, uh, Conventional methods could result in ruthenium iron alloys being present together with segregated iron oxide nanoparticles, together with isolated ruthenium metals. So it makes sense that if uh, one 
uh, comes up with a different uh, catalyst structure, one can get different activity. Another challenge with iron-based materials is uh, difficulty to understand this uh, catalyst using ex situ characterization. What I mean by ex situ characterization? It's when we perform a reaction, take catalyst from reactor, bring to a microscope, and look at it to try to understand the state of the catalyst and try to relate it to its activity. The challenge with iron-based materials is that iron gets oxidized by oxygen even in ambient air, so which makes it extremely difficult to uh, relate property of a material to its activity. So the uh, goal of our project was to use colloidal synthesis to synthesize well-defined <coughs> ruthenium iron heterostructures and use in-situ characterization, basically characterizing materials under reaction conditions to understand whether ruthenium has promotion effect or not. So we, uh, we made uh, these so-called heterodimers, which you can see on figure A, with ruthenium nanoparticles, smaller ruthenium nanoparticles attached to larger uh, iron oxide. And you can see from EDS maps that the presence of two components was confirmed. So once we made these materials, we loaded them on alumina support and studied for CO2 hydrogenation at six bar together with uh, other control samples. <coughs> Before performing the reaction, we reduced catalyst at, in pure hydrogen at 300 degrees Celsius. And what we found is that when we tested pure iron oxide, the catalyst made only two products, methane and CO. And you can see from CO selectivity uh, uh, axis uh, that this catalyst had CO selectivity close to 100%. When we tested pure ruthenium, uh, it also made only two products with uh, significantly lower CO selectivity, consistent with ruthenium nanoparticles being very good at making methane from CO2 and hydrogen. When we tested the physical mixture, we also got only two products with selectivity somewhere in between. But when we tested heterodimers under the same uh, reaction conditions, we formed hydrocarbons. So we, try, uh, we, uh, we got curious and we wondered, uh, wanted to understand in greater detail uh, what causes uh, heterodimers active for hydrocarbon formation. <coughs> And this result also elucidated importance of proximity between ruthenium and iron oxide. So we brought our materials to SLAC National Lab, and we were basically tracing oxidation state of iron in our materials during pretreatment uh, in uh, pure hydrogen. What we found is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we performed our pretreatment at 300 degrees Celsius. We found that at this temperature, iron in pure iron oxide was mostly present as iron to oxide. And metallic iron can only be produced if we reduce catalyst at temperatures higher than 500 degrees Celsius. If we check the literature, iron to oxide is known <coughs> to make um, CO from CO2 and hydrogen. So this oxidation state actually explains our catalytic results. But if we we, if when we did the same with our heterodimers, we found that iron is present as metallic at 300 degrees Celsius in pure hydrogen. So what happens is that when we, uh, what this result means is that by adding ruthenium to iron oxide, we promoted reduction of iron oxide. And this ho happens where a phenomenon called hydrogen spillover effect, where uh, hydrogen gets dissociated into atomic hydrogen by ruthenium, spills over iron oxide, and reduces it. So this difference in uh, oxidation state of iron at 300 degrees Celsius <coughs> explains our results. When we took our materials from reactor, we found that our heterodimers no longer looked like heterodimers. Instead, they were co-shell structures. With, as you can see on this slide, with ruthenium being in the core and iron being uh, outside. So uh, what uh, we found then is that if when we start with 
heterodimer and perform reduction in hydrogen, hydrogen gets activated by ruthenium. And as a result of iron oxide reduction, uh, ruthenium gets encapsulated by iron. And we end up with these core shell structures, which are active for hydrocarbon formation. And this phenomenon is consistent with strong metal support <coughs> interaction effect, which was found in 1987 by Tauster. And uh, this uh, phenomenon uh, says that when reducible oxide gets, uh, gets reduced by hydrogen at high temperatures, it partially reduces and covers metal surface. Since we, know, uh, since we knew that these structures are active, these coastal structures are active for hydrocarbon formation, we wanted to know if we can change or increase hydrocarbon formation by changing the thickness of the shell. So what we did, we made these coastal structures which with much thinner uh, shell made of iron oxide. And when we performed catalytic measurements, we indeed observed fourfold increase in hydrocarbon yield compared to the original heterodimers. So conclusions from this work is that ruthenium promotes reduction of iron oxide via hydrogen spillover effect. Heterodimers upon reduction transform into coastal structures which are active for hydrocarbon formation. And by tuning thickness of the shell, we can change uh, hydrocarbon yield. Our future directions, since we found this interesting synergistic effect when metal nanoparticles get encapsulated by metal oxide, we are now interested in encapsulating nanoparticles inside porous metal oxide. And schematically, what this means is that we'd like to start with well-defined nanoparticles, uh, deposit them on polymer, uh, make a second layer of polymer on top of the first, basically, uh, can have a sandwich structure with nanoparticles encapsulated in polymer, and then use this technique called nanocasting to convert this material into nanoparticles encapsulated in metal oxide, such as alumina. So nanocasting is a procedure where a template gets infiltrated with a metal precursor, and after a certain thermal treatment, uh, the, the original template is removed, and its negative replica is made of uh, metal oxide. With this, I'd like to conclude my presentation. I'd like to thank my PI, Matteo Carniella, uh, Professor, uh, sorry, Simon Berry Group at Slack, our collaborators at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and uh, last but not the least, Precourt Institute for Energy for funding our project. Thank you. <laughs>
However, wind turbines are often placed close together in wind farms in order to save on land cost and also in order to share transmission lines and other energy grid infrastructures such as uh, transformers. However, wind turbines are always controlled as if they're completely isolated. So they're not controlled considering that they're in a wind farm environment, but they're controlled as if they're just standalone in a field. And I've sketched what this looks like in a small wind farm where we have six turbines here and I'm showing a top view where the flow is from left to right. And you can see, uh, as I've colored the, the velocity magnitude in this plot, uh, as the flow is from left to right and every wind turbine is generating what's called a wake region immediately downstream, so immediately to the right of the turbine. And that wake region is predominantly characterized by reduced velocity, reduced momentum, and therefore reduced energy in that wind. And so you could think about it in conservation of energy. Essentially, there's some amount of energy coming into this wind farm, and each turbine is extracting some amount of that energy, and then there's less available for any potential downwind turbines. And then you can see that each wake is then hitting every successive downwind turbine, and thereby reducing the power production that's possible at each downstream turbine. And so in the worst case scenarios of, of real wind farms that are already operational in the world today, this spacing where you have three to four turbine diameters apart between each other, as we show here, uh, results in an efficiency loss of approximately 40% for that system. And so here at Stanford and, and in the Lele and Dabiri lab group, we've been thinking about ways to actually mitigate these wake losses through operational changes at wind farms. So we're not interested in changing the layout where you would move the turbines away from each other because that would be prohibitively expensive and, and challenging to do. But instead, we're thinking about control. And so there are only two ways that you could do control on modern day wind turbines to potentially alleviate these losses without doing significant hardware changes. And that's induction control and yaw control. So today we're going to focus on yaw control. And so as I mentioned, wind turbines are always controlled as if they're completely isolated. And actually the main feature of that is that the wind turbine is constantly turning to face the incoming wind direction. The wind direction is constantly changing in the atmosphere. And what we're interested in doing instead is something somewhat counterintuitive. It's instead to intentionally misalign certain turbines with respect to incoming wind. And so I've sketched what this looks like in, in, a, in a two turbine scenario where we're again viewing it from the top and the flow is from left to right. And I've actually intentionally yaw misaligned this first turbine by the angle gamma with respect to that incoming wind. And what that actually does is it takes that wake region that I mentioned on the previous slide and it deflects it laterally along this center line, this dashed line. And you can see in this case, this center line is, is partially deflected away from that downstream turbine, and thereby increasing the downstream turbine's power production potential. And so what we're really interested in is if there's a case where now that we've yaw misaligned this first turbine, its power goes down as a result of the yaw misalignment, but the downstream turbine's power may increase, and thereby increasing the, the sum of the two turbine uh, power collectively. And so it's, it's thinking about the wind farm as a system rather than individual turbines. And so to think about how we might actually realize these gains at a real wind farm, we need to talk a little bit about how we model wind farms in this community. And so here I'm showing the most famous wind farm. You, you almost can't give a talk in wind energy without showing this wind farm. This is the Horns Rev wind farm off, off the coast of Denmark. And you can see very interesting physics here. Uh, the wakes of each turbine are, are very nicely shown by interesting uh, humidity changes. But essentially, we have complicated uh, mesoscale structures in the atmosphere. We have every turbine generating a wake. The, the wakes are then merging, and, it, and it's sort of complicated what's happening here. And so to actually resolve all of these physics in this wind farm, we would need to do a, a large eddy simulation, it's called, where we resolve all of these scales on a supercomputer simulation, which would take on the order of days to months, depending on the wind farm. And so if we're thinking about doing operational changes, you'd have to then run a new simulation for every, every time you've changed your operation or your layout or, or whatever you're interested in studying, and it becomes very quickly computationally intractable. So instead, what we do is we parameterize the key physics of that wind farm. So we take those complicated physics and we parameterize it in a so-called engineering wake model, where instead of capturing all of the detailed dynamics of that wind farm, we're interested in capturing the main trends of power production at that wind farm. And so this is a sketch of what our, our uh, specific wake model of interest looks like here. The two key features of this wake model that we've selected is that it's able to capture the velocity deficit behind that turbine, that wake region, but also that wake deflection as a, as a function of the yaw misalignment. And so here I'm sketching what the wake looks like behind uh, this turbine, which is yaw misaligned by gamma again. So the wake of a turbine which is not being yaw misaligned would follow this dashed blue line. 
whereas the wake of this yaw missile line turbine follows this solid red line. And then in terms of actually controlling this wind farm, now that we have this wake model, this is the protocol we, we take. So we take this wake model, and then we rely exclusively on the historical data, which is in the form of SCADA data. Uh, if you're familiar with energy grid systems, SCADA data is used uh, uh, for control by the energy grid operators. And it stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, kind of a long name. So we use that SCADA data, which is already recorded at every wind farm in the United States, and we calibrate our wake model to ensure that we're capturing the trends of the power production at the wind farm of interest. Once we've calibrated our wake model, we would then do a control optimization where we pick the optimal yaw misalignment angles for every turbine of interest at this wind farm. Then we would take that to the field, implement that in the wind farm, observe new SCADA data, and then feed it back to the wake model in a closed loop system. And so fortunately, we had the opportunity to partner with TransAlta Corporation in Canada and study one of their wind farms, which is the Summerview One Wind Farm in Alberta. Um, and so I'm showing here on this, is on this left plot what this looks like if you look it up on Google Maps. And then here on this right plot, I'm showing what this wind farm looks like when you normalize the coordinates by the turbine's diameter, which is the relevant length scale of interest. And in particular in this study, we're going to focus just on these six uh, top left turbines in the northwest corner uh, called column B. And so they graciously provided five years of historical SCADA data for every wind turbine at the site in one minute average form, so quite a lot of data. And then we're able to take that data and uh, input it all into what's called a wind rose, which I'm showing here. And if you've never seen a wind rose before, they're really helpful plots because they tell us two things. One, they tell us the dominant wind directions at the site, and so that uh, is showing uh, this view on the compass. And it also sh shows us what the wind speed is. And those are the two main factors in determining where we expect wake losses and how bad we expect the wake losses to be. And so you can see from this wind rose that the predominant winds for this site are coming from the southwest. And if you could imagine the flow coming from the southwest, you can see that the spacing between, let's say, this B column and the A column would be quite generous, something like 10 or 15 turbine diameters. And we actually wouldn't expect significant wake losses. However, you can see on this wind rose that there's a little bump coming from the northwest. And from the northwest, the spacing of these turbines, when it flows uh, in this direction, is actually more like three or four turbine diameters. And as I mentioned in the introduction, at that spacing, we would expect something like 40% efficiency loss for those six turbines. And so, as I mentioned in that uh, control loop, the first thing we need to do is fit our wake model to that historical data. So I'm showing what that looks like here, where the blue is the historical uh, SCADA data, and the error bars denote standard deviation in that data for that inflow direction, that northwest inflow direction in five to six meters per second. And then the red is the model fit to that data. So it's doing fairly well at capturing the trends of the power production. And again, at higher wind speed, we can see we do even better qua uh, quantitatively at capturing uh, the, the power production of these six wind turbines of interest. So now that we've actually calibrated our model and we can see that we can capture the trends of power production quite well, then we need to select the optimal yaw misalignment angles. And that's actually a fairly challenging thing to do because it's hard to know what would be the exact best yaw angles to pick. And if you have a large wind farm, it grows uh, unboundedly very quickly about uh, how many different uh, options you have. And so in particular, we developed a new uh, gradient-based yaw optimizer, which actually utilizes uh, tools from machine learning community. Um, and so it uses the model form of the equations, which we've developed, and then comes up with a, a very efficient optimi optimizer to select the optimal yaw angles. And so you could see for this uh, inflow direction for these six turbines of interest with the different colors, the optimal yaw misalignment angles being selected for each turbine. And what's interesting about this case is we can see that the power production normalized by the baseline power production for this wind direction has increased in this model prediction by over 20%, which is very exciting. And so qualitatively, what that looks like, returning to this figure, where we have that inflow from the northwest direction uh, and, and significant wake losses, if we yaw misalign the turbines in an optimal way, then we could see the wake of each turbine being partially deflected from every successive downwind turbine. And so, we actually had the opportunity to test these yaw misalignment uh, uh, angles on the wind turbines of interest in Alberta, Canada. And uh, so these are the utility scale wind turbines. So each of one of those has a diameter of 80 meters, so quite large. 
And we have yaw misaligned here uh, each of the first five turbines by 20 degrees clockwise with respect to that incoming wind direction from the northwest. And then the last turbine is not yaw misaligned since its wake deflection wouldn't benefit any downstream turbines. And so here I'm, I'm showing uh, just a few of the field experiment results. And again, I'm showing the baseline uh, uh, SCADA data, so the historical data, and the model uh, prediction in this case, as well as the experimental data that we observed in this field campaign. And the main features that are interesting qualitatively from this is that we can see that the first turbine's power production has decreased, as we expect, but the, the downstream five turbines' power production has increased quite significantly in this case. And then at higher wind speed for the same wind direction, we see the same qualitative trends. And now quantitatively, we can see that we've realized quite significant power production increases over the baseline in this experiment, where we increase in the higher wind speed case by 13% power production, and the lower wind speed case by 28% power production uh, for these actual utility scale wind turbines. And so those are just a few of the highlights from this paper, uh, which summarizes the main results uh, recently published on the cover of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And the main results, I only mentioned the, the statistically significant power production increase today, but we also noticed um, that through the mitigation of wake losses, we reduced the variability in the power production, so we reduced the intermittency of the wind farm, and that's because wake losses also contribute to unsteadiness in the power production as a function of time. And of course, there's always uncertainties in future work and research, so we're trying to improve our, our yaw misalignment controller, and we're also interested in, in knowing more about the fatigue loading, so the mechanical loading on the wind turbines when you uh, uh, change the yaw misalignment angle uh, to a non-zero value. And so with that, I will take any questions. I guess we're doing okay. questions together. So. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. That's great. Um, Antonio and Isola, do you want to come up? Um, three excellent presentations. Um, we have, well, about two or three minutes for, <laughs> for questions. Maybe we can stretch that a little bit longer. Um, in the tradition that we have here at the NHS seminar, um, maybe uh, students first, if they could if they want to ask some questions. Yes. I have a question for Michael. Uh, does your the uh, yaw optimization model inform us how to build new wind farms in addition to optimizing current ones? Yeah, absolutely. So with that tool, with the engineering wake model, you can also think about uh, layout optimization. Um, so where to actually place the turbines with respect to one, uh, one another, given a specific <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, I have a question for Antonio. I was curious um, whether you saw whether you see flow batteries being used high energy density flow batteries being used only for grid storage, or whether those would also be potentially usable in electric vehicles or consumer electronics. Yeah. Great question. Thank you very much. It, hello. <laughs> try to keep my answer short, maybe. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think consumer electronics are a stretch, but, you know, heavy duty transportation, uh, you know, personally, I, I, I think it, it could be possible. You know, there's, there's cargo ships in China that are now being battery, uh, battery operated, although they're carrying coal from one port to another. <laughs> But maybe it could be a flow battery. OK. Yeah. Uh, I also have a question for Antonio. So if you were able to find that eutectic point um, with all of your charge carriers, what do you think that the energy density of that would be? Uh, at the beginning, you are comparing the lithium ion versus the flow batteries. How much would you think that would improve? Yeah, yeah, great question. <clears throat> so basically, if on that plot, if if we could have a NAC versus eutectic benzoquinone flow battery, that could get you maybe into the 500, uh, 500 watt hours per kilogram range, which is actually double what current lithium ion batteries are. But that's all theoretical. So then you'd have to slap a percentage off of it for all the stuff that the battery is composed of. So maybe all in, you could get near current generation lithium ion batteries. Now, lithium ion batteries are still improving. So that I think, you know, 10 years later, I, I don't think 
we could outdo lithium ion batteries with a liquid. But if you can at least get into the ballpark, then I think maybe it opens up these other applications too. Okay, last question, I think. Oh, thank you. I have a question to the lady from Kazakhstan. I forgot your name, sorry. I see. Um, if I, is that, if I understand correctly, you're reducing the process steps it would take to produce e fuel or uh, any other carbon hydrates. And uh, how long will it take to commercialize the, that kind of technology? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, well, as I said, fissure trop is a commercialized process, and it is used industrially uh, on some scale. Uh, for CO2 hydrogenation to become commercialized, I think it's, uh, we're still far from uh, making that process uh, feasible in the uh, nearest future because there are many challenges that have to be overcome. And the problem, not only inertness of CO2, but also uh, the different difficulty in controlling product selectivities. So our, in our work, we, we indeed uh, showed that we can make hydrocarbons by reducing CO2 with hydrogen. But uh, ideally, one would want to make a specific type of hydrocarbon, for instance, short, short olefins. Uh, and this uh, selectivity challenge has to be solved first, in my opinion. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think we have to wrap up now. So. Maybe join me one more time in, in thanking all three speakers. <laughs> and uh, th thank you.